you are about to hit 15k subs on youtube i'm just curious like how how does that feel um stressful yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's really the, yeah. i i guess i've grown i guess i've grown pretty quick um, mm-hmm. when Dude. when 2024 hit yeah i was like i think i was about 7k something like that mm-hmm. um so i've grown i've like doubled in like two months or something uh, and it feels nice yeah. but it's also like I I have this like innate pressure that I have to keep making every <laughs> video better, otherwise I'm a failure and I don't deserve to have a YouTube channel. Um, so I, I, I guess there's that. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chocobo Radio, episode number twenty-five. I cannot believe I've been doing this for already 25 episodes but here we are um today we have a very 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 special guest um renan go ahead and introduce yourself for the people who don't know who you are hey hey everyone uh i'm renan i am an eu final fantasy 14 player um i i'm kind of traditionally known partly i used to make guides but more recently i suppose I make long-form deep dives into aspects of the game, mm-hmm. primarily raiding, but also other stuff that people might find interesting. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically what I do. Awesome. Well, you know, with like every other podcast that I have done so far, I always start off with A Realm Reborn. And honestly, I feel like A Realm Reborn has been coming up a lot lately from what I've been seeing, especially with a lot of the Dawn Trail discussion. <clears throat> but I'm interested. Um, how did you get introduced to Final Fantasy XIV, and what did you think of A Realm Reborn? Um, okay, maybe maybe this is gonna <laughs> get me murdered on the spot. So I I originally started playing Final Fantasy XIV in I think 2014, something like that. Mm. Uh, one of my real life friends, he was an end game player at the time. It was like patch 2.2 or something like that. Um, and he wanted me to start playing the game so that we could do Bahamut together. Mm-hmm. He was like, I need some people to do the coils. And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> like end game raiding. That sounds cool. I've never played an MMO before. Sounds interesting. Wow. Uh, I expected that at some point we would play together. Uh, mm-hmm. That did not happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I I went through the Aram Reborn MSQ. Uh, I tried my best to watch the cutscenes. I fell off very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, back then, A Realm Reborn was a little bit of a mess in terms of sequencing. Yeah. So you would have to do long periods of grinding in order to get to the next set of MSQ quests. Mm-hmm. And I fell off at level 47 because oh. there was a sequence uh, right before the end of A Realm Reborn. Right. <laughs> um, you had to... <laughs> I think anyone that was around back then probably remembers it. Mm-hmm. You had to grind fates from around level 44 to like 49 with only one dungeon in between. Wow. And fates back then gave basically no XP, so I dropped off the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I came back like two day- two years later, something like that, about two years later, where- when Heaven's Ward released. I've yeah. uh, been playing pretty avidly since then. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I-, I skipped the MSQ. So what did I think of ARR? Uh, it was rough. Uh, <laughs> I think yeah. it's a bit better now, mm-hmm. but it was-, it was a rough time back then. Yeah, which, which is so, which is so uh, interesting because, you know, Yoshi P made a lot of headlines uh, this week when... Um, you know, he kind of alluded to, sort of alluded to, and he was talking about possibly giving new players a uh, a skip from... I, I know the translation and all that has kind of been up in the air, and and I know that they're, you know, thinking about it, but I am curious as to how you feel about that. Should new players have to experience the full 100, 200 hours that it takes to get through, uh, get through ARR to Endwalker? Or do you think that we should probably give new players, you know, a new starting point? I am kind of in favor of it, honestly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, 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 I know that there are a lot of people that really love the MSQ and those people are very valid. Yeah. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people, including me, who just didn't play the MSQ. Like, <laughs> to this day, I haven't. I, I played the Heaven's Ward MSQ. That was it. It was good. I enjoyed it. I'm sure I'll play the rest of the MSQ at some point. Yeah. But I've been playing 
almost a decade at this point, and I haven't indulged in almost any of the MSQ. And I still enjoy the game a lot. I love logging wow. in. Yeah. I always find something to do. Mm-hmm. Now, th- um, so that that is actually pretty sorry, interesting. You... So when when you say when you say that you haven't hit any of the MSQ, like are you like literally you haven't really necessarily played through any of it, or do you kind of just you know? just look at the voice cut scenes or like how, how like what exactly do you N- do nothing like? nothing nothing at all nothing that the, is... the only things <laughs> that i know about the story are things that i've like kind of absorbed via osmosis from <laughs> other people talking about them while i was there mm-hmm. that's it i i don't know anything else yeah. i i skipped all the amarok cut scenes <laughs> i skipped all the heidelin cut scenes i got i've Wait, can I swear on this podcast? Fuck I've got yeah. no, <laughs> I've got no fucking clue. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, so to me, like, I've seen the statement being thrown around that the main scenario of FF14 is, according to a lot of uh, Twitter users, eighty percent of the experience. Mm. And for me, it's been like five percent. <laughs> and I know that's the case for a lot of other people. And I also know that. A lot of other people are in the same situation as me, mm-hmm. where they fell off in A Realm Reborn. They yeah. they just it didn't really click for them because A Realm Reborn is a very slow paced world building, ten to fifteen hour slog, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and some people just aren't in the mood for that. They want to go and play with their friends, and they yeah. want to see the combat system in its final form. So I think that having a skip for those people is very valid because it's not taking anything from anyone else, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you could always go through uh, New Game Plus and you know experience it that way because uh, I know myself like I I'm I'm not a full on skipper. I did skip through a lot of Realm Reborn. I skipped through like maybe mm. half of Heaven's Sword until like the until it started getting interesting. But what I ended up yeah, doing yeah. was I just went on YouTube, looked up a bunch of lore videos, and basically just caught myself up once I uh, once I once I actually started engaging with the story because I feel like there are a lot of games out there, this one including included that you sort of play through it, you go through the motions, and then eventually at some point something clicks and then all of a mm, sudden yeah. you make Final Fantasy fourteen your entire lifestyle. And I feel like a yeah, lot I, of people get to I that. agree. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people live within those small social bubbles within that where they think that the thing that made it click for them Mm -hmm. is going to be what made it click for everybody. But there's so many different things and there's so many types of players that... uh, That's why I'm I'm always in favor of skips because I think that if the thing that might make you click Mm -hmm. is not having to play the MSQ, that's a plus. And Square Enix probably makes some money off it as well, especially with skip potions, right? Yeah. Um... And it, it might be fishing, for example. It might be raiding. It might be it might be anything. The, there's a lot of different options, and I think that all of them are pretty valid. And I mean, the MSQ is always there, even yeah. if people skip. The MSQ is always there as an option. They can do new game plus. They can make a second character, whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think, and and that's kind of that. That is one of the that is one of the hot takes that I think I've always had about this game is that I feel like the devs put a lot or maybe most of their priority into msq and i feel that while that is okay i still think there are other places in this game that the devs should be putting more time into like the fact that a lot of the raids don't even have voice acting i think for me that has always been one of the uh the biggest downsides to this game is that sure we have you know 30, 40 hours of voice cutscenes in, in Endwalker or whatever the number is. But when it comes to a lot of the other side content, there really isn't any of that voice acting. And I feel that when it comes to a game like this, a lot of the time that you're that, that you spend is just reading uh, dialogue, which, you know, it's OK. You know, some yeah, people like to yeah. read, but a lot of people like me who you know grew up playing you know shooting games or like all these other games and then when you when you're asking me to spend two three hours just sitting by myself reading dialogue it it, it really hard it's hard to make it engaging yeah and i mean especially oh it, it's not really a problem for me but i can understand how it could become an issue uh, the the small parts that i have read often 
they like to use ye olde English quite a lot, more than just Durian Jay's mm. voice acting. Yeah. And I can, I can see how it can be a bit dense I, and unengaging if you haven't found the hook yet. I've said it, I've said it so many times, but I understand like 60% of what Durian Jay says at a given time. <laughs> yeah. I would say 50 on a good day. <laughs> yeah. Um so Yoshi P also, you know, there was there was this uh interview that he made and he also talked about um one of his biggest regrets uh that he, you know, noticed when he was at FanFest and he said um but that remains of something that I regret. As we've continued to operate 14, we've made the game more comfortable, a game that you can play without stress. But looking back on the last 10 years, I'm thinking we overdone it a bit. Um, do you agree with him? Is 14 too easy? Should it be harder? How, how, do, how do you take this? Um, so my interpretation of this is it's... It's both yes and no, right? Mm -hmm. I think the end game rating in FF14 mostly is in a pretty good spot. Yeah, uh, I think the ultimates are in a pretty good spot. I I think that top was a good place for kind of the pinnacle difficulty in the game and DSR as well. Mm -hmm. I think that while the savages have a bit of an issue with difficulty scaling, on the whole, the kind of difficulty that they lie in is a good difficulty as well. I don't think it's too hard or too easy. Yeah. Um, I think that the issue comes in with more casual content. Like, uh, I wouldn't say dungeons. I think dungeons are fine. I think they're supposed mm -hmm. to be kind of... How do, how do I say it? They're, they're like just mindless press buttons. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. I think that's fine. Um, I think alliance raids and normal raids maybe are in a situation where they are slightly too hmm. free for people to go in and get through without knowing any of the mechanics. Hmm. And I think I, I, my, my interpretation of when he said he wants to bring stress back doesn't refer to increasing the difficulty ceiling mm -hmm. or even necessarily the floor, but to some of those in-between pieces of content, they might be a little too unengaging for people. So like for yeah. For example, Stormblood Alliance raids are something that people often harken back to, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were not too difficult, but they would wipe you if you completely ignored the mechanics. That doesn't really happen anymore. Yeah, uh, I think the normal raids could maybe do with being a bit more punishing. And I also think it might... I think the stress might not just be in terms of whether you can die in a piece of content. I think it might just be to do with the amount of investment you need to put in to obtain things. Um mm -hmm my my secretly partially salty reference to that is the relic quest right where <laughs> i think the adding a little bit of stress in the obtaining of a relic once more as opposed to the end orca one could do the game a lot of good mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so and uh, okay <laughs> you know because i so I, I was talking to wesk alber uh, uh like a month ago or something and you know i i think everyone pretty much knows how he feels about the relic grind in endwalker um how did you feel about it because I think for me, so you have to realize, like, you know, I've, I've, I've only started playing this game about two years ago. So I haven't been around that long, as long as, uh, you know, some people like you or others have. But for me, the way that I saw it was whenever I talk to someone, I ask them, you know, how many relic weapons do you actually have? And I feel like the, mo the majority of people that I've talked to is either one or two or zero. Whereas an Endwalker, at least now you have the ability to gain more, like, hoard all of these relic weapons. So I think for me, I was, like, okay with it. But at the same time, I've never really actually experienced what a relic grind is on, um, like, on a current uh, uh, expansion. So I'm just wondering, like, how did you see it when it first started? And how do you see it now? Um, I suppose to put into a frame of reference, my mm. biggest worry for Dawn Trail, which has luckily been alleviated since then, yeah. was that Yoshi P and the Square Enix team would look at the engagement rates of the Endwalker relics and go, we did a really good job there, lads. There's people <laughs> doing more relics than ever. <laughs> yeah. Because to at least to me, um, I, I wasn't a fan. I wasn't like a very vocal this is terrible thing because mm -hmm. i i can understand the positives of having a very simple relic where you can obtain a lot yeah uh as a player who even has very limited playing time there are good things to being able to do that but for me i think that for both more hardcore players and more casual players 
the relics are a piece of content that pushes them all into the exact same pipeline where they have to engage with one another and play together, at least traditionally, mm -hmm. where four or five times, maybe a few more, an expansion, a piece of content or a relic update that will get them going into old content will release. Mm -hmm. And for those periods of a couple of weeks to a month, everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, and usually they're quite community-driven things, for example, Eureka and Bosha, oh. and it forces these interactions that you can't get anywhere else, mm -hmm. where players are talking or hanging out in, in a zone with with kind of no pressure to go and do the next thing, just waiting for something to spawn, and they interact, and I think it's a very healthy, old-style MMO thing Yeah, FF14 kind of lacks otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that when we come to this period, at the end of the expansion, where there is nothing new to do, mm -hmm. having something that will take you many hours to do, say, on every job, uh, like in Shadowbringers, I did every relic on content because yeah. I, I have the time and I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, having something that could take dozens or even hundreds of hours to do that you can do if you want, that is current expansion content, I think is only a healthy thing. Because yeah. if you don't have the time to do it, that's fine. You don't have to do it, right? It's optional. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think personally, sense. that's pretty healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 Dawn Troll is going to be interesting. It, it does. It does seem like um, a lot of the community has this expectation where you know they're going to open up a new chapter and then the game is going to feel you know different. I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case i feel like we're going to get a little bit more of the same with you know some new stuff sprinkled in but yeah, we'll see yeah we'll see this is going to be the first expansion that i play on launch and i think that's going to be interesting for me because i've just never experienced that yeah it's exciting the first month of an expansion is really cool just that everyone's very excited about everything it's a really nice yeah. it's a, it's a nice time to be playing ff14 mm -hmm. um so I, I know that you are a big raider, um, but you, I think you, you mentioned that this was your first MMO. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. What were you playing? Like, like what, what was like the type of games that you played before 14? And how did you, you know, get sucked into this um, ultimate rating, you know, trying to be like world first? Like, how, how did you get into that, um, that process? Um... I suppose it was kind of a pseudo MMO, but b before I started FF, I played I played quite a lot of Destiny. I played mm. a few other shooters, like a bit of Call of Duty stuff like that. I played single player games, and that was about it. Yeah. Um, I like I enjoyed playing video games. Uh, I wouldn't say I was the hugest gamer in the world, but mm. I I still like played a a decent amount. Mm -hmm. um, but when I when I started playing FF fourteen. I'll be honest, I was really shit at the game. Um, <laughs> like most of us. <laughs> I, was, I was really bad. Yeah. Um, and I got to Endgame. When I first got to Endgame at the start of Heaven's Ward, I joined a... This is a, a story I like to tell on my stream. I love People it. always eye roll whenever I do. <laughs> um, I first got to Endgame, and this was when Bismarck and Ravana Extreme were the current EXs. Right. Um, and I joined a Bismarck Extreme party um, for Prog, and I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And... The, the dragon killers that you use to bring the boss in so that you can do damage to it, those were the healer's responsibility. And I didn't know that because I didn't know you were supposed to watch a guide for content to know what you were doing. Yeah. I thought, oh yeah, prog party from start. I was like, oh great, I'll just join and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they got mad at me for not hitting the dragon killer and I got kicked from the party. And, I, I, and that mortified me <laughs> so much that I quit the game for a month. And when I came back... <laughs> When I came back, I was like really committed that I'm never going to be that fucking embarrassed ever again. <laughs> so I like tried really hard to get good at the game. Um, and I learned that it's very fun improving and I just kind of went from there. Yeah. Um, you know, so for, for those of us who have never, you know, participated in like a world first race or, you know, progging a raid um, on launch day. Um, can you explain like the process of, of what is that like? Like, how do you... I can never I never understood how do you go into a savage raid completely fresh, not knowing anything about the fight, and then just, you know, trying to figure out the mechanics. Like how do you is is that difficult for you? Like how do you do that? Um, it's it is tough. Um, I think the way that you you handle it, it very much depends on your group. Um yeah. 
I think I'm very lucky in that I have a I have a group of very good people who I'm also very good friends with around me, and we've like been playing together for a long time. Mm. Um, usually, when you're doing blind prog, um, I think mentality is a lot of it, and knowing that you need to keep very calm, keep mm. your personality nice and muted, so that you can focus on the prog. And when it comes to solving mechanics, it's usually the way that we normally solve mechanics, at least uh, traditionally, you can't do it quite as much nowadays, mm-hmm. is we would we would see what's happening. Like, we would watch uh, back the footage of the fresh mechanic that we've seen. Yeah. We'd decipher, say, like, the key tenets of the mechanic. So if we go to P9S, for example, and we look at Limit Cut, we'd go, okay, so we know that there's these orbs appearing on players. There's orbs in the arena. They have numbers on them. We know that the boss is jumping to players one by one. Mm. And then... We think, firstly, how do these target? Secondly, what sequence occurs? Like, what what are the bullet point orders of this happens and this happens and this happens? Mm. And how do each of these things target? And then you kind of think, okay, so now where's the arena space? Where do we put people to make it so that people don't explode? And then you just try stuff. You have like a... Sometimes it works straight away, especially with simpler mechanics. More complex ones, you have to like iterate and right. go, okay, so... This th- we got the players in the right spot for the blue markers. That's good. But now, now, Mister Red Mage is exploding because we're splatting him every time. So now we need to figure out where he's got to go and yeah, like that. It's just kind of an iterative experience. It's it's very yeah. fun though, tiring but fun. Yeah, yeah. And and I know I know you have a couple of um, you know I know you participated in the race. You have a couple, especially on your YouTube. You have like about seven of them. But I'm I'm interested in. Uh, is there like a particular raid that you're most proud of? Is yeah, like what, what, like one that you have like the most memories of? Um, maybe it's just because I'm old and I have a bad memory, but I I think I have the fondest memories from top. Um, it's not my best placement. Uh, like we, I think we got like tenth or eleventh or some shit. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, we we. We didn't do like exceptionally well that prog. It wasn't like a standout prog. We did fine. We didn't do bad. Yeah. Um, but I learned, uh, I learned during that prog that the thing that I value more than anything else is having a very fun, chill experience with nice people, and that's what that prog was <laughs> the entire time. Because we were raiding for fifteen hours a day for Whoa, like. Dude nine or ten days yeah. and there wasn't a single day where i didn't want to be there because everyone was just so pleasant you uh-huh. know yeah i've i've been i've been a part of two statics so far and they've all fallen apart at some point um mainly due to like differing emotions uh between the players but i'm 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 wondering like when it comes to you when it comes to like the statics that you were part of um like what do you think is like the most important part of keeping a static together because it does seem like you're just dealing with emotions uh, a lot. Yeah, it it is kind of. <laughs> I think my experience with statics is very much that as a static leader, you kind of have to deal with everyone's personal drama, and it's very <laughs> mm-hmm. tiring. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the best way you can make a static that isn't going to implode, at least during prog, <laughs> or if they disband, it should be on good terms. Is usually. You want to make sure that everybody has the same expectations. Mm. Um, for example, that could be we want to we want to get a top ten placement. We want to clear week X, or we don't really care about performance. We just want to have fun. Like whatever whatever your goals are, that's fine. Yeah. As long as everybody has the same goals and they want those goals mm-hmm. relatively as much as one another. For yeah. example, I think one of the biggest problems comes in where you get these groups and. Uh, player X is is looking for players and he asks his friends and he's like, I really want to get a week one clear. Mm -hmm. And some of his friends are like, yeah, sure, I'll join. I don't really care, but it's fine. Okay, that person is probably going to leave halfway through prog. They're going to realize that the part of prog is like boring and slow and actually a little bit unfun. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. like, especially the parts where you're tired and you want to sleep. And mentally, they'll tap out. So you want people that want the same thing as you as much as you. And then I think everything kind of comes together afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's a, it's an experience, I would say, just just dealing with so many people. Um, yeah. But uh, so I am curious, like if if you could if you could make like an all star uh, party static, 
um if it could be anybody any creator any youtuber you know anybody anybody that you know like do you have like this dream static um that would be like the best most perfect for you i would i would give a cop out on answer and say no <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you, you already have it, but maybe yeah. i shouldn't i think i think rather than like naming people mm -hmm. i i think what i learned um like i've raided with like at least in prog i've raided with like a handful of creators that, that were very pleasant to raid with like i raided with style and Zedem and arthur's and stuff mm -hmm. like that and they're all very they're all very nice to raid with and i would raid with them all again yeah um for me i think the most important thing and if I had that thing, I would be very happy in a group. Mm -hmm. It's just that the people are nice and that they don't they don't um suffer, shall we say, from prog fatigue. And I yeah. think I think a lot of people fall in that. And I would I would be very happy to play with anyone that, gotcha. <laughs> that, that doesn't fall into those two categories, honestly. Yeah. Have have you ever had <laughs> have you ever had to have like a conversation with a like a, a particular member where like you're like, hey, you're not doing enough DPS. Like, how, how do you handle those situations where there's like an obvious weak link? Um. So, <laughs> I before I started doing hardcore prog, I was in like some evening groups, and it definitely mm -hmm. came up more there than it than it does now. Mm -hmm. um, <sighs> this is this has worked with various levels of success yeah. so i would say take what i'm saying with a big huge grain of salt <laughs> but the, i i think the worst thing you can do is not say anything mm -hmm. but the only thing that's almost as bad as not saying anything is saying any is saying something in a in a bad time or a disrespectful way yeah i think that you gotta you gotta like pull them up one to one after raid and say, "Look, okay, I'm, I, I I hate to say this, but there's a problem. You keep dying <laughs> to the same mechanic twenty times in the in the raid, and yeah, we need to we need to talk about this. Can we help you? Is the important thing to say. Is there anything mm. we can do? <laughs> um, but some some people will immediately fix an issue if they know there's an issue yeah. and they're just not aware of it. Mm -hmm. Some people don't really care that much and then it will spiral if it's not bought up and eventually they're removed. I think yeah. I think groups are often too scared to kick people. Um, sometimes it's just not going to work out and it is what it is. Yeah. It, it can be respectful for both parties to be like, okay, I think I think like we can still be friends, but maybe it's maybe we need a different player. You know, I think mm -hmm. I think that that is a very respectful thing to do to both people's time. Yeah, sometimes. Um one of the things that like one of the most consistent um i guess complaints that i've always heard about this game has to do with healing and um i'm just wondering has that always been a complaint that you have seen that people are always complaining about how healing works in this game and um how would you change it or fix it I think people have always complained about healing, but they complain about healing in different ways. Because mm. I feel like in Heaven's Ward, a lot of people complained that the the complaint was generally that healing is very clunky in Heaven's Ward because of the way the cleric stance worked back then, where oh. you you essentially you press the cleric stance button to be able to do damage, mm. and then you're locked out of using any healing GCDs for five seconds because your heals do nothing. Yeah. Uh, people found it very clunky and a bit of a problem. At least the average player did. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Stormblood, they they reworked Cleric Stance. They simplified healers quite a bit. Not as much as they are now. Yeah. Um, and the issue suddenly became, oh, healers are too easy now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, and then, then we get to... to um, Shadowbringers and Endwalker, and the proposed uh, the the thing that I see thrown around a lot as a proposed solution mm -hmm. to those issues is, well, why don't we increase the amount of healing you need to do? Um, and that's not a solution because <laughs> the 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 issue isn't that healers can just heal too much. Right. That's not the problem. Um, the problem, because uh, I guess just to explain, if the issue was simply um, Oh, the healers can heal too much. Then the the easy solution, yeah, sure, would be to increase the damage that comes out. Right. But if you do that, then the average player, the person who doesn't really end game raid, he now can't do savage. 
even if he wants to, whereas right now he can, because the skill ceiling and the skill floor will be so far removed from one another that that guy is going to be completely destroyed whenever he takes on anything that right. requires endgame healing. I think the real issue with healing right now is healing Cadence, right? Uh, so the issue is that FF14 encounters like to follow a very set design mm -hmm. where they have an instance of raid-wide damage and a mechanic on the 60 seconds, and then you get like 30 to 60 seconds where nothing happens, and then there's <clears throat> another one, and then there's another one. Yeah. Or if they want to do multiple damages back-to-back, -back, they will they will split them up just enough that you can use the patented mitigation macro that works for literally everything in the game, and then you're done. Um, I think that giving you interesting healing challenges both in terms of timing and targeting mm -hmm. is probably the way that you make healer feel more engaging and also more difficult yeah um i i know i'm rambling a bit but i think I, that this is also the reason why the no healer top clear was firstly possible and secondly <laughs> yeah. why a lot of people bring it up as a reason that healers suck <laughs> but they don't know why they're actually why they don't know why the top clear is an issue mm -hmm. they think that this this means that they're that the fights don't do enough damage but it's actually like a cadence issue right? again right? Yeah. like i said um because top does a lot of damage it, stuff hits really hard mm -hmm. the problem is it hits really hard once and then you do nothing for 60 seconds so you can just stack mitigation for the one hit and then let people passively regen up right like that that's yeah. what the problem is yeah, like, um, I, I, I've been playing a lot of uh, Seven Rebirth lately, and... Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, like, I'm, I'm, so I'm playing Rebirth, and then I'm playing 14, and honestly, I, I just, I, I just think 14 needs to have, like, a, 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 just a combat overhaul. I feel, I feel like where we are at now, you know, 11, 10, 10, 11 years after the game has come out, I feel like we're getting to the point where it's getting a little stale, and I think they need to start making some big changes. Um, what kind of changes that would be, you know, who knows? But maybe maybe it's just because I've never really been a big MMO guy. Um, but I, I just always found a lot of the, the boss encounters, the boss fights, the trials. I think for me, the one thing that I've always hated about uh, the combat of this game is the fact that when you have a tank, you know, he's basically just taking up all of the aggro. So the boss is basically just either facing the tank or, or auto attacking the tank and then loading in mm -hmm. attacks as well. I've always wanted a little bit more flexibility with that system. Like I, I wish I wish tanks could lose aggro a little bit easier. And then that way they have to, I don't know, maybe provoke maybe make yeah, that a little bit more interesting but i i will mm. say that used to be a thing and i used to yeah. <laughs> i used to think it was interesting as too uh -huh. and, I, and i was really disappointed when they basically removed it wow <laughs> i thought i thought it was very fun yeah yeah because like as a tank you know it's cool you know you you have the boss that is you know facing you and attacking you but when you're just playing as a dps you know you're kind of just off in the side the boss maybe will turn around and throw you a line aoe but for the most part, you're kind of just standing there. And I feel like that, to me, is one of the things that I never really cared about. But again, I'm not an MMO guy, so maybe maybe I'm just a little biased. But that that's a, that has always been my complaint with the combat. I, I agree to an extent. I think that, like, just for a second to talk about the aggro thing, mm -hmm. one of my, my favorite old things, like little optimization things from, like, old FF14 yeah. was on Heaven's World Warrior, right? Uh, so back then they had they had three combos. They had an aggro combo, they had a buff combo, and they had like a like a third combo, right? Mm -hmm. And the the aggro combo did the most damage, mm. which, um, but because the warrior would often say not be tanking because like the dark knight is tanking, for example, yeah. the warrior would have to manage how many aggro combos they can do without accidentally ripping aggro. Mm. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I thought it was cool because you needed to pay attention. And when it came to DPS as well, um, DPS would have aggro cut or aggro reduction abilities. And if they didn't yeah. use them and the tank was not using tank stance because it was a damage boost, mm -hmm. they'd rip aggro. So they, they had they had these extra responsibilities to, 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 to fulfill mm -hmm. that were removed 
but the issue is that there was nothing put in place of it, right? Yeah. Um, so I think I think that's honestly why a lot of people feel the game is becoming less complex because they're they're removing like gameplay elements, mm -hmm. and I think it's fine to remove gameplay elements, but there's never anything added in place to of it, right? It, so yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. So I think that there's just an overall lessening com in complexity. That said. Yeah mechanics are getting way more complex so they're, mm -hmm. they're kind of like That's shifting true. it right yeah they're shifting it away from the job and, and shifting it more to the encounter yeah i i guess i just i just kind of wish it just wasn't like floor aoe's because i feel like the majority of mechanics that mm. you have to worry about are like floor aoe's or um and i just i feel like if they were to add say I don't know, like a, a, a like a dodge mechanic or like a parry mechanic. I feel like they could do a lot more with those. Um, but I don't know. Like like I said, you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not a big time raider or anything, so um, I might just be talking out of my ass. But I just when, whenever I play other like action or, uh, RPGs, like 16 or 7 Rebirth, I'm just like, damn, I kind of wish I had this combat <laughs> instead of what we have now. But yeah, I, I'm kind of curious to see what they do for the, the 16 collab, you know, because I yeah. feel like when they did when they did the 15 collab, I don't think the combat system could quite keep up with what they wanted to do. Mm, so I wonder yeah. if they implement the 16 collab a little bit better. I'd love yeah. to see if they implement any of the, yeah. the like a, a live action features of the game. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I, I would be really interested to see that. Maybe if it gets really well received, they can they can like... Uh, backfill it into certain other aspects of the game as well yeah that'd be cool um you know we are at the end of endwalker and i'm curious like in retrospect what do you think of the new mechanics that were added into endwalker like for example island sanctuary how much time did you spend in island sanctuary be honest <laughs> um i got i got to max level oh okay um That's pretty good <laughs> i i i did everything in it mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i was disappointed <laughs> 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 yeah i yeah i feel like i actually think the leveling process of island sanctuary was okay even though it's literally just you know go around the island and gather some stuff mm -hmm. i didn't mind that i was okay with having a mindless grind yeah what i don't like is that the end game is literally here are retainers enjoy <laughs> that's the end game of island yeah. sanctuary this it's just fisher price retainers <laughs> but you don't make real gill from it mm -hmm. um so yeah, I I was I I was kind of I, and this might just be me, um, you know, getting my expectations too high. But I was kind of hoping they would do more of a, uh, you know, those games where you have to you know build a base and then you go out and gather materials and then you build like a workshop and then you gather more materials and then you build like a hammer. I, I thought something similar. that is what I wanted. <laughs> this is what I was expecting. That is, yeah. yeah, and what we got. And I, I think I think what we got is also like a big um, problem with fourteen is that a lot of its like little quirky mechanics are all kind of just point and click stuff. And then you just have a little loading bar, and then you know it, it kind of ends there. I feel like what the game should start doing a little bit more is start making little mini games for these mechanics, make it a, a little bit more gamey as opposed to just making it a, a like it's like what you just click it and then you have a little loading bar and then that's kind of it like i just i don't know i don't know like i don't know what they could do but it's just it's it, they could improve it you know and that's the good thing about this mmo is that they're constantly improving it they're constantly adding new things and um that's basically what keeps me hyped about this game is that you know it's they're going to keep working on it and making it better yeah i think i think island sanctuary was kind of it, I think Island Sanctuary was one of those ideas that that sounded better in their heads, right? Mm. Where because when it was initially pitched as this is a type of lifestyle content, you'll get your own island, we'll yeah. have all these activities you can do in it. Mm. Sounds good, um, but I think when it came down to what are the activities going to be, I think um, they might have maybe not really had a concrete idea, and so it yeah. panned out being. Mm -hmm. We're going to reuse some old systems like the gathering system and stuff like that rather than anything new. Yeah, I, I think um, the, my favorite part about it is the fact that you can do it while queuing up for like a roulette. Because that that's the one thing yeah, that I wish yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah. Like you re uh, that uh, Bosja would have is just the ability to queue up while you're, you know, in there. 
Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, variant dungeons, criterion dungeons, how did you feel about those? <laughs> I think the criterion dungeons mm -hmm. were the single best piece of content added this mm -hmm, expansion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the variant dungeons, I'm not the target audience, so like <laughs> I, I understand that I, like I didn't really care. They're fine to go through. I'm yeah. not like particularly exhilarated, but that's fine. I'm not the target audience. Sure. Criterion, however, amazing. Mm. I think I think all three Criterion dungeons were very good, very engaging. Mm -hmm. um, the Savages had a really bad reward structure, but it, it's getting better. I think by Dawn Trail it'll be fine. That doesn't really bother me too much. Yeah. What, what I can say is I just really enjoyed doing them mm. uh, because they. They like showcasing mechanics that they wouldn't dare do any anywhere else. They get really experimental and and punishing, and it's a lot of fun. I really like the Criterions. Awesome. Uh, Crystalline Conflict and the state of PvP? I played a lot of CC Season 1. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to... Is Same. Crystal the highest rank? I think it is. Uh, I, I got to the, the highest rank mm -hmm. um, in the ranked. Enjoyed it quite a lot. And then for some reason... I felt absolutely no desire to go back. <laughs> I don't know why, because I enjoyed yeah. what I played, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't really gone back very much yet. Do you do PvP a lot? Because I, I hardly ever do PvP. I'll, I'll probably do like a uh, front Not too relax. often, no. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a novice PvP. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Eureka Orthos, how, how, did, how did you feel about Deep Dungeon? I liked Orthos quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I I recently did Palace of the Dead solo, right? Um, oh, okay. that's the most recent one that I did, uh, and it yeah. was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I understand why Deep Dungeon veterans don't like Orthos as much as they like the new one, yeah. uh, as much as they like the old one. Sorry, yeah. I understand that. Um, because there's a big paradigm shift between the older Deep Dungeons in terms of design and the new ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically gone from being a timer and damage balance and like managing your resources to being mechanics 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 and mm -hmm. not much else um but i thought Orthos was really fun i i i, I really like the bosses i thought the bosses were fantastic for a deep dungeon yeah. um they were so much better than the other deep dungeons bosses to the point where even if the other things are a little bit behind, I think it was a better experience on the whole. So I'm excited for the Dawn Trail one. Yeah. Hopefully they can strike a balance. Yeah, like uh, f for me, I am a big, big, big um, roguelite, you know, player. I love Hades. I love Binding of Isaac. I love, you know, all of those games. And I feel like for me, the only thing that I would improve with Deep Dungeon is just to make it a little bit more like a roguelite. Um, because you know you're almost yeah. there they it's basically there the only thing that we don't have is this like constant uh upgrade progression system which that would, i, I that would, would love awesome. to see them do some wacky shit with it yeah <laughs> like um, imagine <laughs> to be imagine like as a caster you know you finish up you beat the the deep dungeon boss and then you go on to the next floor and then you imagine you having like a, a dual cast on like a black mage like that would be fucking sick you know, like, just make it as wacky, make it as, uh, just let, let yourself get OP, and then also make the enemies, or, like, the, the dungeon bosses a little bit more OP, just to balance it out, and it would be the best game mode in the game, in my opinion. The, the thing that I think would be really interesting about Deep Dungeon is, uh... The changes I would make, mm -hmm. just if if I was the designer, yeah. I would make it firstly so there's an endless mode that just gets oh, harder and harder and yep, harder. Yep. And you see how deep you can go. Mm -hmm. um, I would make it so that you can also have a you queue in to just a, a single 10 floor set that's a way later. So you can just do the interesting floors if you want to. Yeah. And thirdly, I would implement a version of the, is it the lost action system from like Bosha and late Eureka? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, because I thought I think lost actions are really fun. <laughs> yeah, lie. yeah, and I would love to see them in more stuff. Yep, I agree. I agree. Which which kind of speaks to what you said, right? About like having having like instant casts and stuff like that, mm. or or additional abilities. Yeah, and being able to lock those into like a certain run, and you lose them after the run, and yeah. stuff like that. It, it, I think it would be interesting. That, I, it, perfect. Like, it might it might end up terrible, but I would be happier <laughs> if they took the risk than not. Yeah, know? yeah. Just give it just just give it a try. You know, and that's all I ask for. Um, 
so I, I want to, uh, you know, transition over to your YouTube, to your, uh, you know, being a content creator. Um, sure. You know, you you are about to hit 15k subs on YouTube. I'm just curious, like, how how does that feel? Um, stressful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really. The, yeah. I I guess I've grown. I guess I've grown pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. When D when dude. 2024 hit, yeah, I was like, I think I was about 7k, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've grown, I've like doubled in like two months or something. Uh, and it feels nice, yeah. but it's also like, I, I have this like innate pressure that I have to keep making every <laughs> video better. Otherwise I'm a failure and I don't deserve to have a YouTube channel. Um, so I, I, I guess there's that. What do you consider a successful video? Because honestly, like for like the past three months, you have been consistently hitting like 50 100k views so i'm just wondering like in your mind like what do you consider a successful video um i suppose it's uh, first of all i'm 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 a i'm not gonna lie i'm a little bit of a slave to the youtube algorithm um, <laughs> yeah I sp when it, when a new video comes out, I spend way too much time watching what number out of ten it is, and if it's like <laughs> below a five out of ten, I'm like, oh no, this is terrible. Oh fuck, it's it needs to be a top five. It needs to be a top five. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Um, but I think more than more than me just anxiety braining. I think as long as people like it, um, I I'm kind of content after that stress has gone. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, because at mean, least the majority. I, I I saw you know like there there like three years ago you made a video you know about how you were so like excited about hitting one k subs, and then yeah. now <laughs> yeah. you know I go on Social Blade and I just look at your stats and I'm like you're getting about two like two k subs a month like that is insane, but I I am curious because. I think I remember hearing uh, Linus Tech Tips talk about how subscriber counts on youtube does not matter anymore it's all about the algorithm it's all I, about your thumb i would agree yeah so i was just wondering like how, how like how do you how do you see that i i 100 percent agree um i think that sub counts are almost meaningless in mm -hmm. terms of how large you actually are as a channel um i think that it's all that matters is if you put out a video or how many views are you gonna get are people going to watch it? Like, um, I suppose uh, that may not be a healthy way of thinking about it, but it's 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 kind of like the pragmatic truth, right? Where um, how many people engage with your content defines how useful your content is to people. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if if you release a guide and twenty people watch it, it might it, it might be useful to half of those people, but if somebody releases a guide on the same piece of content and a thousand people watch it and a lower percentage find it useful that's still more people that found the piece of content useful right mm -hmm. um and i think that i think that your your sub count doesn't matter too much because despite what a lot of people say the youtube algorithm has a very efficient way of connecting people to content they might be interesting in mm -hmm. uh interested in even sorry i promise i can speak english um and it's it's usually if your video isn't doing uh like views it's usually at least what i found out a case of either titling thumbnailing or the first minute not popping enough yeah. in terms of people's visibility mm -hmm. um i know for me at least the i how do i say this i basically took like a week of just studying youtube mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. And the number one change that I made is instead of opening up a video and talking about a topic like the way I normally would, I instead reworked the first minute to be really, really exciting mm -hmm. visually and uh, have like a, an instant hook in the first like 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. And I think on, on that one, on that video, my views went from average like 5 to 10K mm -hmm. to 100K. Like wow. instantly, the second I made that change, like yeah. it because people gave me more of a chance because the intro was interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, that's the one more thing... than just. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I know I'm talking for ages. <laughs> no, but, I, I was just going to say I, I could that, probably um... talk about YouTube all day. Yeah, no, no, that, <laughs> but, that's but right, like that's right more here. than. <laughs> 
more than that, like it wasn't just the view count because I also think that the view count isn't the number one stat. It yeah. was the average view duration that went up. Mm. I, my average view duration went up when I did that from two and a half minutes to seven minutes immediately, like tripled. Yeah. And the videos weren't like way better. It was literally just that more people were giving it a chance mm -hmm. because instead of doing a boring intro, I did an interesting one. That was literally it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, so, so I, they they were more they were more like purity tested and willing mm -hmm. to be like okay so the video the start's good I'm sure the rest will be good so I'll give it ten minutes of my time you know yeah yeah because I, so I I come from the TikTok side of the internet and even with that with TikTok the first five seconds are really the most important part of, yeah. of your video because if you can't engage them if you can't hook them just within those few seconds they're gone and yeah they just they just scroll yeah yeah and i think for me one of the one of the hardest transitions that i made into youtube was the fact that you have to come up with a title and a thumbnail and i think for me those two aspects of your title mean everything because if you cannot get yeah. someone to even click on your video you can have the best video ever created but no one's gonna watch it and i'm i'm just wondering like yeah. for you um was that hard for you to to like um to manage like when it when it comes to actually titling and making a thumbnail like what is your thought process behind that um it was an inner conflict to an extent i think <laughs> because i i think i have like a very analytical brain yeah so i would always initially try to title things in a way that was very factually accurate and would convey the exact point of the video with mm -hmm. no like superfluous elements <laughs> and making sure I didn't miss anything off. Yeah. But that's terrible if you're trying to make good titles. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> yeah. that's like the, the last thing you want to do. Uh -huh. um, I know that some people get annoyed about uh, clickbait in general on YouTube. Unfortunately, that's just the game. It, it it's works. basically you, you you take the concept and you go, how can I convey this in a way that will make people want to want to see it? Yeah. And as long as the video is good, I think that usually people are pretty okay with that. They don't feel like they've been cheated, you know? Yeah. Because I, they, I think they Mr. got a good experience out of it. Yeah, I, I think Mr. B said it best when he said, you know, you can have a clickbait title, just make sure that the video actually, you know, uh, makes sense and it, it makes sense with the title. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's. Uh, I think it's totally reasonable to have a clickbait title in current YouTube day and age, as long as it's technically correct. Yeah. The video is good to the point where the viewer doesn't feel cheated. Mm -hmm. um, is there like an upcoming sub goal that you're most excited to hit? Like, is it twenty k, a hundred k? Um. So my twenty twenty four sub goal mm -hmm. was fifteen k. So mm. I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm quite excited to hit that. Yeah. Um, after that, I guess we'll, we'll just see what happens. Um, yeah. I would love for one day to get a YouTube play button, but we'll see if that ever. So yeah. Like 100k, right? I think mean, that that is the that that is the craziest thing about just having this conversation is the fact that the growth that you are having today um, is you know pretty immaculate, but. In about a year's time, if you continue going where you're at, you know, you are going to start get, hitting these numbers that a lot of these, like, full-time content creators are, are hitting. And I'm just wondering, like, has that set in already? Like, is that, is that something that you're thinking about? Like, are you a full-time content creator yet? Uh, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I'm always expecting the next video to flop, so I'm trying <laughs> to not get hopes up too yeah. much. <laughs> So I, I I guess like I'm I'm kind of playing it by by ear and mm -hmm. is that, just is that hoping the... that I can keep making good stuff mm -hmm. and then we'll see what happens. I guess is that the end goal for you, like being like a full time content creator, streamer, you know, like Xenos and Zeppla, or are you kind of just okay with just doing this on the side and just would, keeping your day job? It it would be nice. Um, I would I would like to be able to. I I told myself like um, if I could make a full time salary of content creation for three months in a row, then I would allow myself to invest like way more time and energy, and also invest some of that money back into like 
getting help with like editing and stuff like that maybe like help with short form and shit like that yeah uh this month was the third month that i've made at least like minimum wage from content creation so yeah. maybe we'll see what happens yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like um that that's kind of that, that's kind of where, where i'm at as well like um i finally made my first like purchase with my youtube money which it was just a ps5 so i'm kind of like reinvesting it oh, that's in based. the channel but yeah it's, it's yeah it's, yeah it's, it's, it's interesting you know like i've never like it for me being like a youtuber always kind of had that same veil of like being like a movie star or being like a you know like one of those like jobs that kind of everybody wants but only a handful of people um actually do but um the reason i bring this up is because like i said like you know you're kind of getting to that point and i'm just wondering like the people around you the people who know you irl like your friends and stuff like how much of your YouTube have, like, have they been, like, a part of, like, do you talk about this with your family and your friends? Or are you kind of just, you know? Oh, like, no, is, not is really. Him? Okay, no, yeah. <laughs> not really, no. Uh -huh. No, it's, it's like, uh, I, I suppose it's like a, a private thing to me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, like, to speak on what you said before as well, like, I'm I'm very uncomfortable with the spotlight, you know. I'm one of those people that, that kind of hates being center of attention. So I try not to I, I try not to like brag or big myself up or mm -hmm. talk too much about myself unless unless it's like a very specific situation, which I guess this one is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. what, what what So I, I guess that like the 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 like i suppose like the star aspect of being a youtuber obviously i'm a very small youtuber yeah, so i'm not yeah, that yeah. anyway but but um i think i think for me i would probably only be interested in making a really good next video rather than like <laughs> kind of basking in it i guess I don't uh, know. yeah yeah and i mean honestly it it, it it does kind of scare me as well because you know i i think we've all seen how twitter drama pops up and how like a lot of these you know big creators start eventually sometimes get into these like drama stuff and i feel like for me that has always been the, the scariest part about getting bigger like getting becoming like a big creator do you ever do you ever think about that um i think <laughs> I know that some people like to get in, involved in one another quite a lot from what i've noticed <laughs> mm -hmm. um I think that for me, like I, I understand there's some people that are that are very good at engaging in drama or uh like you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. For me I just kind of I, I very much don't enjoy it, so I just try my best <laughs> to keep to myself and, yeah. <laughs> and then, then hope that things the things just resolve one after another, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but I usually when I see like content creators even even when it's like very petty drama um like like what i like to call quote-unquote fun drama yeah which is like petty drama that doesn't really hurt anybody even even that like yeah <laughs> i think i would find very stressful to be involved in that's seeing true. it from the outside isn't too bad but being involved in it sounds like a very stressful thing that i wouldn't be good yeah at. <laughs> it, it is funny because you know you, you you see like all these like uh minecraft youtubers getting into like all this like really weird stuff that i don't really want to talk about but when it comes to 14 and 14 drama it's like a like a fucking lalafell chair you know it's like the the dumbest shit ever but it's oh, so it's so funny to insane. me insane <laughs> yeah and i think that's what i love about the drama of of 14 is that it's always very low stakes and very petty and very dumb yeah the way the way i think about it is if if somebody didn't if it's not like a serious topic and nobody really got hurt like mm -hmm. i don't think it's too harmful yeah. um i do notice that ff14 uh content creators definitely have a tendency that whenever a content drought occurs they're they're uh, <laughs> on the lookout shall we say endwalker is the worst expansion on. ever created <laughs> <laughs> that that was a pretty fun time yeah that was uh that was <laughs> I, I respect the clickbait of it, to be <laughs> fair, but, but also uh, maybe a bit far. Yeah. Um, what motivated you to making videos in the first place? Because I know you started off by just um, posting like your raid clears and then eventually you got into guides. But I'm just wondering, like, what was yeah. that thought process like to wanting to actually script out a video and then voice it and, and edit it and all that stuff? Um, 
I think I might have told this before, mm-hmm. but I initially started off kind of as a as a bit of a streamer, like not mm-hmm. not really a big streamer or anything, like a five five viewer streamer at most. Yeah. Um, and I started streaming because I was in a group with a couple of streamers at the time, and it looked fun. So I decided I'd give it a go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and it was as simple as that. And it it was fun, but I learned that I'm. I don't think I'll ever be a particularly great streamer because yeah. um, I don't think I'm very well spoken unless I'm able to script something in advance Same. and I like get stun locked pretty easily and stuff like that. Like I don't <laughs> think I'm a, I'm amazing with my words. <laughs> uh-huh. So I decided that maybe something I would be better at is is like writing and then recording videos. So mm-hmm. I gave it a go, um, and I was clearing content pretty quick because uh, I was in like a, a world pro group. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, maybe guides is the natural point of call so i started doing those after a little while um they did pretty good um i think at one point i i i went through like kind of a bit of like crisis of identity where i was Mm. like so what do i actually want to do because i'm just doing this because i can do it you know um that was like a more recent thing which is why there was a pretty significant like style change in my videos over the last few months where i like worked very hard on improving like my hard skills and finding out yeah how i wanted to present things and stuff yeah as and and looking as a as an outsider as a fan of your work um honestly i think your documentary series are like they're genius i i like i think those are some of the best content that i have seen from 14 creators in a long time and I think you should really keep doing those because they're, they're that's that's really kind of you. <laughs> um, I I definitely learn a lot. Both like I've done two of them now. I learn mm-hmm. I learn a, I learn an absolute ton each time. So mm-hmm. I hope the next one will be better. Um, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, they're, they're like a huge. <laughs> what, what's coming up next? <laughs> um, I can say that it's not about raiding. Okay. <laughs> but I'm also working on one about raiding. Yeah. Um. I, I won't say exactly what it what it's about, but it, yeah, it's not a raiding focused one. It is uh, a story from another subcategory of the FF14 mm. community that I think has been quite undercovered or undertold. Yeah. That I hope will be interesting to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think we're all excited for that. Um, <laughs> did, did you teach yourself to? edit videos or do you have like professional like a professional background behind it i learned it all myself um i i used to use sony vegas up Mm -hmm. until uh i think like november this year yeah and i was very terrible at it i had no idea what i was doing Mm -hmm. um i literally just found a bunch of youtube videos from youtube and professional film editors yeah that had tutorials i spent a week watching them and and then I made the DSR video. <laughs> basically, <laughs> yeah. that was uh, that was basically it. Uh-huh. Um, so, so is your 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 current YouTube channel is that like your first foray into like making videos for YouTube, or have you ever done anything before that for other games? Maybe. Um, I think I I've done like a few videos in the past. I don't think they even exist anymore. The mm. channel had like 50 subs or some shit. Um <laughs> like it was it was like a, a like yeah. a nothing channel, you know, like nobody nobody watched it or anything. Mm. Um I think I got like 10 views of videos stuff like that. <laughs> you know, it was like not good. Mm-hmm. Um that I I did like it, it was just variety gaming basically. Um you know back when in the early like 2010s people used to do live commentaries and stuff like that it was it was something along those veins wow. <laughs> that trade of I'm, thought i'm sure it was a, it was a very long it. time ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> if, it, if it exists and somebody finds it i will be impressed <laughs> well you heard it here first um <laughs> so you know I've, I've been like i said like I've, I've done this podcast already with uh, about 25 other creators and i feel like for a majority of them they have always told me that um whenever they make like a non-14 video maybe like from another video game never really does that well and a lot of creators feel that they're kind of boxed in to only making 14 content i'm just wondering do you feel that way will will we ever see a non-14 like video on your channel how do you how do you see that um 
I've actually been toying with the idea because at some point, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to be soon, but at some point, I definitely will make videos for things that are not just FF14. Mm -hmm. I am not sure. If, like, I'll keep making FF14 as well, but uh, it's because like I like other games as well, so I want to talk yeah. about them uh, or make interesting things with them. I'm not sure if it will be on the same channel or not. Mm. Um, I'm still like weighing up the pros and cons because there, there's a lot of pros and cons to doing it on the same channel versus yeah. like cutting your losses and making a new one. Starting fresh. Uh, I I haven't scary. quite decided what I would do yet, mm -hmm. but I think the way I would probably do it is just make something that I think is cool and then either post it on the main channel or a sub channel and see what happens. I know that there's a there's a few content creators that have done like branched out from ff14 very successfully mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so i suppose i will probably look to them and see exactly what they did yeah that's a good <laughs> basically, idea basically you know and uh -huh. decide if it's a good risk or not yeah <laughs> okay um you know we are we're basically a third of the way through 2024 and i'm just wondering um you know what kind of future plans do you have for your channel um I want to make some more cool documentaries until <laughs> yeah, Dawn Trail comes awesome. out. Mm -hmm. um, when Dawn Trail comes out, I have been secretly learning uh, 2D animation to make strat, like uh, moving strat images so that mm -hmm. I can make way better guides than I did before in Dawn Trail. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully I will make some cool job and potentially encounter guides in Dawn Trail and then just keep doing what I'm doing when there's content lulls, you know? Um, yeah. We'll just see where it goes from there. I guess I guess I'll just play it by ear, yeah. Awesome. Well, that is pretty much going to do it for us, chat. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to Twitch chat. Thank you for TikTok chat. Um I wanna give you the last word. Go ahead and uh plug your channel, plug whatever you have coming up in the future, and um yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, you can uh, you can check me out on YouTube and Twitch uh, forward slash Rin Banana and on Twitter at Rin on Banana. Um, I post some things occasionally. Some of them are cool. If you enjoy them, I, I enjoy you. Thank you very much. <laughs>